Welcome. Good evening, uh, everyone. We're thrilled to have you join us tonight, uh, this evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this event, uh, as I said, the sixth uh, in the Cracking the Cancer Code series, Precision Medicine for Personal Disease. Hey everybody, it's good to see you. Tonight, uh, you will hear from local experts in precision medicine, each who has their own special kind of expertise. Uh, and this is a really, uh, I always say it's special, but to tonight I was thinking about how just a, a little over a decade ago, um, someone very close to me was diagnosed with an aggressive and devastating cancer. And in that like 10 days after he was first diagnosed, we had so many emails from people who had seen this story on the news about this new immunotherapy and that maybe we should start calling people and maybe something could be done. And uh, it was exciting. Like, it was really, we were on the cusp of a new era in cancer therapy. That was clear, but it was um, still too far away for my person, and that person was my husband. And so it's a real treat to be here tonight uh, to listen to these speakers. Uh, and I will say I've been paying attention to the developments in this field ever since. And the, the pace of change in cancer care feels like it's quickening. As an example, the state of the science has progressed even since I first met these speakers just a couple of months ago. And I think what they would, will say tonight is different than they would have said six months ago, maybe even what they would have said three months ago. Um, and so I'll give you how it's gonna go. We have three speakers. They should each speak for about 15 minutes each. Uh, and then they'll join me on stage for a panel discussion and we will have about a half hour uh, for audience questions near the end. Sorry, I wasn't thinking that I'd do the first introduction at the same time, or I would have had it on the same page. Uh, our first speaker tonight is Dr. Ted Varhe. He is a senior bioinformatics scientist in the Charbonneau Cancer Institute at the University of Calgary. I think he's our, our resident data nerd tonight. I think that's a fair description. Uh, he works with scientists and physicians to advance precision medicine for cancer patients with glioblastoma and sarcoma. Ted. Thank you, Christina. Every day, the average person loses 37,000 skin cells without even realizing it. Now, I want you to multiply that number by one billion, and you have the number of cells in the human body. 37 trillion, that's a huge number. Cancer is a disease of cells, so if we want to create precision treatments, we need to better understand our cells and what happens when they go rogue. I am a bioinformatics scientist, and that means that my job is to analyze huge volumes of data from cancer patients. More than ever before, new technologies are generating data so we can understand cancer at a cellular level. And this is propelling a new era of cancer treatment. But we're not quite there yet. Despite the overwhelming data footprint that is accumulating, it can seem like cancer treatments sometimes still resemble something closer to a sledgehammer. Today, I want to talk to you about precision medicine for cancer treatment, about how we can move from blunt instruments towards more targeted therapies. And I often think that one of the best ways to think about uh, where we need to go is to start by looking at where we've come from. Cancer has been around for as long as we can remember, and the very first cancer treatment was surgery. In the first century, a Roman physician named Celsus wrote this about cancer. After excision, even when a scar has formed, Nonetheless, the disease has returned. Surgery often caused life-threatening infections, but even when that wasn't the case, Celsus could see that surgery was ineffective. Fast forward to the early 1900s. People knew what cancer was, but there was too much fear and stigma to talk about it. A cancer diagnosis meant certain death, and it was so feared patients often did not tell their friends or relatives that they had it. Uh, on occasion, doctors would even withhold that they had diagnosed it in their patients. So efforts to raise awareness of what cancer was and the importance of uh, early detection uh, overcame huge barriers and increased the prognosis uh, of cancer patients significantly. In 1901, x-rays are discovered that have a variety of applications to medicine. However, it took 35 years to experiment with doses and timing uh, before radiotherapy has proven to be effective against cancer. Soon after, antibiotics were discovered 
which prevented infection and improved the success of surgery greatly. In the 1940s and 50s, chemotherapies were discovered and were effective to inhibit cancer growth. But 80 years later, these three treatments, surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation, are still the most widespread. These treatments are, like the sledgehammer, imprecise. They kill cancer cells, but as we all know, they often do other damage too. What we need to do is break the rules of cancer treatment. We need to think differently about cancer, about what causes each cancer, and about what we can do about it. And a huge part of aiming towards more precise therapy is recognizing that every person's cancer is different. For a long time, cancer treatments were like this drug, administered to an undistinguished group of patients. For some patients, this drug worked well, and for others, it did nothing. And then for some, it can lead to adverse events. Now, let's say that we can improve our diagnostics, analyzing a patient's DNA, biomarkers, lifestyle, and other risk factors. This information can help us to distinguish our patients from each other. For example, even though these patients might all have brain cancer, now we can distinguish different types of brain cancer and predict what treatment or combination of treatments would be most effective. This is called precision medicine. In this model, we can figure out how to optimize our treatment based on each patient's unique cancer. Sometimes we can even design a new treatment for an individual patient, and this is something that's called personalized medicine. It's very exciting to see that this is happening right here, right now. So how do we figure out more precisely what is happening in each patient's tumor so that we can develop more precise therapies? The key is to understanding cancer at a cellular level. Now, if you're like me, uh, you really, really don't want to go back to junior high. Um, but please be patient with me for a minute, and I promise that um, you'll get a better idea if I can refresh you on your cell biology of how precision medicines work and why this is the way forward. Our bodies are made up of 37 trillion cells, but these cells are not all the same. Cells come in different varieties called cell types. Muscle cells are different from skin cells and neurons, for example. Uh, and this diagram shows only some of, some of these cell types from a few tissues in the body. Uh, but scientists are still discovering new cell types. And recent estimates put the number at around 500 uh, different cell types, and that doesn't even include those in the brain. Cells also depend on and communicate with each other. Each cell is a highly specialized component of a tissue, part of an organ, which is part of an organ system, all of which work together to keep us alive. So the question is, how does each cell know its place, what it can be, and what it can do? The answer is in its DNA code the set of rules which will determine everything about this cell for the rest of its lifetime. As a scientist, I've spent 15 years trying to understand the rules encoded by the DNA and how these rules can govern each of our body's 37 trillion cells. We often think of DNA as the inherited material that defines our hair color and our height, but I want us to remember that uh, the DNA code operates independently within each cell. It dictates its shape and size, whether it can divide and grow or whether it needs to self-destruct. The cell's DNA will determine whether the cell is stationary or mobile, and it can dictate what the cell should do if it receives signals from its environment. These rules are essential for making sure that each cell behaves properly. But damage to the DNA can cause alterations, including mutations, that break these rules and forever alter the course of that cell. Now, this is key for us to remember. The cancer cells go rogue because they are controlled by the DNA. If we can decode that DNA, we should be able to crack the cancer code and design a precision therapy that intercepts and shuts down the trajectory of that cell, cancer cell. The earliest example of this kind of precision medicine begins in 1960. Two researchers named Noel and Hungerford were studying leukemia cells. They looked at DNA molecules from these cells, and they observed that one of the two chromosome 22 molecules was slightly shorter than expected. Others working on this observed that one of the chromosome 9 molecules was longer than expected. Eventually, over many years, scientists figured out that the two DNA molecules had swapped their ends in something called DNA translocation. What happened is that these two genes, named BCR and ABL, were 
which are normally on different DNA molecules, were accidentally stitched together. The resulting DNA created this BCR-ABL fusion gene that made the cell break the rules about cell division and start dividing when it shouldn't have. By 1998, researchers had created a drug called Gleevec, which specifically stuck to the BCR-ABL fusion gene and turned it off. With traditional chemotherapy, only 45% of patients survived after five years. With Gleevec, that number jumped to 93%. In 2001, 41 years after the discovery about the cancer's genetic change, the FDA approved Gleevec. This precision medicine could only be created with knowledge of the genetic change in the tumor's DNA. That knowledge identified a specific weakness of those cancer cells that could be exploited with a targeted therapy. Now, the discovery of genetic alterations in cancer was a, was a revolution. It motivated the search for all kinds of genetic alterations, and not just those that you can see with a microscope. In 2001, the human genome was sequenced, giving scientists insight into the entire uh, blueprint for human life. Here are the journal covers from the day that the human genome sequence was published. Over time, it became much cheaper to sequence a person's whole genome. Starting in 2008, researchers from around the world collaborated to sequence the DNA for over 11,000 patients representing 33 different cancer types. The sequence of every individual's tumor and normal DNA generated huge amounts of data and opened the door to understand exactly how cancer can break the rules. For example, researchers found that some genes are mutated quite often in one or more cancer types. But they also found that there were many, many individual mutations happening in genes for which they could not understand their function. These mutations had no context and no one knew what they did or whether they were important for cancer. And as a result, scientists began to classify genes and mutations by their effect on the cells themselves. As they studied them, they found that the mutations generally had one of these 10 effects on the cells, telling the cell to grow all the time, ignoring signals to stop growing, hiding from the immune system's killer cells, becoming immortal and living forever, creating self-serving inflammation, invading into different tissues, creating blood vessels to feed the cancer, creating even more mutations, resisting normal cell death, and altering cellular metabolism. And over time, as scientists identified how all these mutations altered the cells, they were able to design drugs that specifically target them. Here what I'm showing is one pill icon that represents uh, an individual gene for which there is a targeted therapy that is now approved by the FDA as of 2020. First, I'd like you to appreciate just how many targeted therapies are in active use right now. Second, I want you to appreciate that all of these came about in the 20 years since the human genome was first published, compared to the 41 years that it took to develop Gleevec. Thirdly, recognize that as precision medicines, these are not necessarily restricted to a single cancer type. Since we understand the DNA basis for these treatments, it is conceivable that any patient with the right genetic profile could be a candidate. And finally, the work is not done. I mentioned before that scientists are still discovering new cell types, but they are also still discovering what genes can do and what effects mutations can have on cells. And this effort has accelerated greatly in the last five years with technologies that can measure what every gene is doing in single cells, as well as at every point in 2D or even 3D space. We can now see exactly what the cancer cells are doing when they communicate with the immune cells. We're able to see how they invade into healthy tissue. And the door is opening to discover new kinds of therapies that we couldn't even imagine until now. I want to highlight just how much precision medicine has accomplished with the example of non-small cell lung cancer. This timeline shows an icon for each new therapy approved by the FDA. The last two decades have seen huge numbers of targeted therapies, including immunotherapies, and the life expectancy of lung cancer patients has grown by leaps. It took thousands of years from the days of Celsius to the point where surgery was a safe and beneficial treatment. And it took decades from the first chemotherapy to the first targeted therapy. And now, every few months, patients are provided with a newer, safer, and more effective precision medicine. 
I started my career as a biochemistry student working with cells, tissues, and chemicals. And when I tell people that I'm a scientist, uh, that's what most people think that I do. However, science has changed profoundly. New technologies mean that we are generating data faster than we can understand it, and a new kind of scientist is needed. We need scientists that can connect information from different sources to uncover precisely what the cancer cells are doing inside the tumor, outside the tumor, and at the boundaries. We are just beginning to achieve the precision that we need to understand cancer at a cellular level. We know much more today about our 37 trillion cells than we knew five years ago. We can, and we must, use this knowledge to put cells back in their place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ted. That was really wonderful. Um, and I th that was a really fascinating glimpse into the detective work that goes on behind the scenes in the cracking of the cancer code. And so next, uh, our next speaker is going to take us from that place to looking at patient-level research and care. Uh, Mona Shafee is a clinical associate professor in the Division of Hematology and Hematological Malignancies at the University of Calgary and medical director of the Alberta Blood and Marrow Transport Transplant Program. A researcher and a physician, she is focused on blood cancers. Mona. I've always loved puzzles. My brain really likes it when things fit together, making order out of chaos. It's very satisfying to get to the solution of a puzzle when everything clicks into place. When people ask me about what got me interested in medicine as a career, my answer is a common one. I wanted to help people. My love of math and science steered me towards a career in hematology, a field that relies heavily on the basic sciences and the tools they provide to manage patients with blood disorders and blood cancers. It was a natural fit for me, one where I can join my love of solving puzzles to helping patients with the problems they bring to me. Today, I'm excited to share a story about how a team of scientists and doctors in Calgary have found the puzzle pieces we needed for a potential answer to a complex medical problem with no available solution. As most medical stories begin, this one starts with a patient. A teenager at the time who had been having a fairly typical life until she wasn't. She found a lump in her right hip and unfortunately was diagnosed with cancer. This turned out to be alveolar soft part sarcoma, a cancer of the soft tissues like muscle, but also an extremely rare tumor one in which only 20 patients in Canada are known to be diagnosed with at any given time. Unfortunately for her, the cancer had already spread to her lungs and brain at the time she was diagnosed, which isn't good news, as it meant treatment for cure was not believed to be possible. Her chances of surviving more than five years was thought to be less than 20%. Surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, these are still the old go-to standard treatments for cancer in the modern age of medicine. Our patient had plenty of those treatments with sur multiple surgeries over the last seven years to remove tumors from her muscle, her brain, her spine, her lung, her colon, her pancreas, plus a little radiation and radiosurgery. Unfortunately, her cancer kept coming back and eventually she's gonna run out of options. But we still have hope we can do something about that. Cancer treatment has improved dramatically in the last few decades, with precision medicine and personalized treatments leading to better outcomes for patients, including treatments that target the tumor directly, known as molecular targeted therapy, and immunotherapy, which harnesses the patient's own immune system to treat cancer. In particular, the advances in immunotherapy over the last 10 years have been tremendous, and is now considered an important part of successfully treating a variety of different cancers. Now, in order to understand how immunotherapy works, you need to know the basics of a healthy immune system. So let me give you a quick primer. Our immune system is a complex network of cells, antibodies, and other molecules that work together to defend us against infections, but are also important in getting rid of old or damaged cells, including cancerous cells. 
T cells, in particular, are important immune cells that become activated when they sense danger, usually an infected or diseased cell. And when this happens, the activated T cells aim to kill these dangerous cells. And through the wonders of medicine, we've learned how to manipulate the immune system to work for us. For example, using vaccines to trigger a mild reaction so that when the real infection comes along, our systems are primed for it. But when it comes to using immunotherapy for cancer, the same type of thing happens. This time, the target is on the cancer cell itself, and the immune cells are directed toward it. Chimeric Antigen Receptor T-Cell Therapy, or CAR-T for short, is the most promising immunotherapy I've had the privilege of offering my patients to treat their otherwise fatal blood cancers. Patients who would have previously succumbed to their illnesses are now achieving long-lasting cures after treatment. Emily Whitehead, pictured here in May of this year, was the first child who ever received this treatment for leukemia. And she's still alive and in remission more than 11 years after treatment. CAR T-cell therapy is an example of personalized and precision medicine since it involves taking the patient's own immune cells, their T-cells, and re-engineering them to fight their cancer. To achieve this, the cells are collected first from the patient, modified in the laboratory via a complex manufacturing process, then genetically rewired so that the T-cell recognizes a target found on the cancer cell. The CAR T-cells are then infused back into the patient where they seek out and destroy the cancer. Unlike other types of cancer treatment, this is a type of living medicine, as these modified immune cells can remain active for a very long period of time, keeping patients in remission. Let me introduce you to one of my patients, who's allowed me to share part of her story. She was sent to me by her hematologist when she had unfortunately failed her chemotherapy treatment for her aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, a common type of blood cancer. While she wasn't responding to the treatment that she was receiving, she was still doing well physically, so she was considered a good candidate for the CAR T cell therapy. This is her earlier this year in the hospital day unit undergoing apheresis, the procedure we use to collect her immune cells called lymphocytes, which include those T cells. <clears throat> her arms are stretched out and she has two intravenous lines to allow the blood to circulate through the apheresis machine where we can collect just the lymphocytes and then the rest of the blood goes back to her. She's got to stay like this for hours in the hospital until we get everything we need. Then the cells are shipped to a manufacturing site to make the CAR-T treatment. Here she is again in hospital, this time about four weeks later, proudly holding that bag that contains the CAR-T treatment. Prior to this picture, her body had been conditioned with chemotherapy that allows the CAR T cells to work more effectively. She then receives the CAR T therapy via infusion through her IV, monitored in the hospital for a couple of weeks, and managed for any complications related to the treatment. One month after her treatment, we could already see her lymphoma was shrinking. Three months later, she was confirmed to be a complete remission, cancer free, for the first time since she began her cancer journey. She's now more than six months since her treatment, getting her life back on track, and even thinking about returning to work in the new year. Her story is one that's been repeated many times in the last few years in Calgary. I actually saw a patient last week in my clinic. I treated her with CAR-T 18 months ago, and she was regaling me with her travels to Iceland, Alaska, England, and was looking forward to her trip to Ireland next year. Actually, I was quite jealous. <laughs> uh, CAR T cell therapy has given people hope for that future that would not have been possible before. So let's get back to our patient with the rare sarcoma. When we tried to find something readily available to treat her rare cancer amongst all those new molecular targeted therapies, we came up empty. CAR T cell therapy for sarcoma, or any tumor outside of a blood cancer, is really only available in experimental trials. And none of these trials have included her type of cancer. So we thought to ourselves, can we design a cell therapy for our patient? Can we use the tools in precision medicine that are available to us to come up with a personalized medicine to treat her tumor successfully? In order to address this question, we first needed to find a few of those puzzle pieces before getting the answer we all wanted for this patient. CAR-T cell therapy for blood cancers is different than CAR-T cell therapy for solid tumors, like our patient with the rare sarcoma. Blood cancers often have the same target on their cells, which makes things simpler. 
So I can use the CAR T-cell therapy to treat aggressive lymphoma, to treat a B-cell leukemia, to treat a slow-growing lymphoma. Unfortunately, sarcoma doesn't have this target. And things are much more complex with each type of sarcoma being different. And we didn't readily know what should be targeted. So our first step was to study her cancer in the laboratory and find a potential target, one that's found on the surface of her cancer cells. A long time ago, she agreed to give her pathology samples at the time of her surgeries to a research biobank so that we could study her cancer in the laboratory. And this allowed us to test all of her tumor samples for a potential target. And with a lot of hard work by our scientific team, we found one. And we could identify it in every one of her cancer samples. Finding this first and essential piece was cause for celebration, as it gave us hope that we could really move forward with creating precision medicine for her sarcoma. So our next step was to build the CAR T-cell therapy, test it in the laboratory, and make sure it worked before using it in the patient. With collaborations across the country with colleagues in Ottawa and BC, we were able to gather the components we needed to manufacture the CAR T-cell therapy right here in Calgary. And once we did that, we went on to prove in the laboratory that these CAR T-cells could target the sarcoma the way we had wanted it to. Another piece of the puzzle was found. The final puzzle piece we needed was to prove that this newly created medicine could find and kill the patient's own tumor cells. So what we did is we used the living mouse model of the patient's own tumor, which allowed us to visualize the tumor through time without sacrificing the animals. Before treatment, the tumor is seen in the body of the mouse as a bright fluorescent color. The mice are then treated with the CAR-T therapy we designed specifically to treat this tumor. Within four days of the treatment, we can already see that the tumor appears to be shrinking. By seven days, the tumor continues to shrink and has already disappeared from one of the mice. By 14 days, all the tumors have disappeared. And this was sustained in six weeks. In fact, some of our mice are still going on longer than a year, tumor-free, after this treatment. We have successfully used the precision techniques we have at our disposal to create a personalized medicine for a patient in need of treatment for a life-threatening cancer. This treatment we've created is considered experimental, a first-in-human type of therapy. So there are strict rules and regulations that we have to follow before we can offer this treatment to the patient. Health Canada regulates all medicines in Canada, including CAR T-cell therapy and requires us to administer this new treatment through a clinical trial so that the patient is monitored carefully, not just for efficacy or how well the treatment worked, but also for safety. For a patient to qualify for a treatment where the side effects may be severe or even life-threatening, we have to exhaust all available treatments first. We do expect this to happen sometime in the future for our patient, and we are now ready to use this treatment when it's needed. In the meantime, there are other patients with this type of cancer across the country who may benefit. So we have a sarcoma patient now who has in fact received this treatment last week, who is currently being monitored in hospital, and we are all hoping things go well. We've also managed to find the target we discovered in this sarcoma and other types of cancer, including some forms of kidney cancer and even breast cancer. And because of the work, we now have plans to use the treatment in a clinical trial to be open across other CAR-T centers in the country for patients with specific cancers that could potentially benefit from this treatment. In this way, the work we did to solve the problem from our one patient may go on to help so many others. Our journey and this story doesn't end here. We have ambitious plans to tackle many more puzzles that our patients bring to us right here in Calgary. It'll take a village, the right team members, and the infrastructure to carry out all this work to create more designer cell therapies for cancer patients who need them. We're going to create a vibrant discovery and innovation program to help find us those new targets on other cancers. A biomanufacturing program to create the new medicine safely and cost-effectively and an integrated clinical research program where patients can receive these medicines on clinical trials and hopefully benefit from these treatments. 
By bringing these programs together, this allows us to continue to work on some of the most complex puzzles facing the cancer field. I'd like to make a special thank you to the patients. Those who have, who are going through their own cancer journey, who have taken the time to donate their tumor samples to the research biobanks, in the hopes that one day we'll learn something about their cancer so we can do something about it. I feel truly honored to be part of this story, and I look forward to offering more of these personalized precision medicines to the patients that need them. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mona. That's really incredible uh, listening to you tell that story. Um, our also incredible is our next speaker, and she is a brilliant young researcher in health sciences at the University of Calgary. She's really quite remarkable, and, and, and so I decided that I would do both you and her a disservice if I just tried to introduce her by reading her bio. I think she's actually best to tell you about her herself, and so please welcome Milan Heck to the stage. I'd like you all to take a look at me and think about what you might say about my appearance. You'd probably say that I look like a relatively normal young woman, someone who appears to be healthy and maybe even confident because here I am on a stage talking to all of you. But what you probably wouldn't say is that I look like a cancer patient and it's because I don't. I still have all of my hair, I'm not isolated in a hospital room and I don't look like that image of cancer because put simply, my cancer is very different. For myself and patients like me, we don't have that image because we don't have a treatment. I wouldn't have known that I would have been in this posi position when I was diagnosed because frankly, I didn't really know what my diagnosis meant. I think that diagnosis moment is something that a lot of people wonder about. People paint a picture of it in their heads, something like a grim hospital room, concerned faces from doctors and tears from family members. Many patients describe it as the moment that cancer entered their life or became real for them. And while this sequence of events holds true for myself, it wasn't actually the moment that cancer became real. Perhaps that's because as a rare disease patient, there is no immediate treatment plan. There's no standard treatment plan. My diagnosis at 14 was stage four alveolar soft part sarcoma. So I had a primary tissue in my right hip, primary tumor in my right hip, and it had spread to both of my lungs as well as my brain. Even saying that now, I understand that it sounds bad. And at the time I knew it was bad, but I had no sense of the actual gravity of what I was dealing with. The future is something that's uncertain for all cancer patients, but for many, there's a semblance of expectation that exists. Whether it's statistics, a detailed prognosis, or even watching the lived experiences of those who share a diagnosis, there are these frames of reference that exist, and that's a luxury that I never got to have. Anticipating anything of what was to come was really like taking steps through a labyrinth in the dark. The initial segment of my treatment began with radiation to the tumor in my hip, followed by a resection and reconstructive surgery. I then had resections performed on both of my lungs, and finally, gamma radiation delivered to my brain. And of course it was hard, and of course it hurt, but when I came out to the other side of it, I really thought in my head that I was at the end. In a strange way, I actually felt like I got the easy cancer. I mean, I kept my hair, I wasn't in hospital for too long, and I even finished school on time. So I thought I had it easy, but this would prove to be a very premature conclusion as complications began arising only several months after. I began experiencing these debilitating headaches, headaches that made my eyes feel like they were being pushed out of their sockets, and that is when we knew something was wrong. 
Scans revealed that I had extreme swelling in my brain, which was attributed to the radiation I received earlier that year. And this was combated with a months long regimen of steroids. And this was all for us to find out that the radiation actually didn't work at all, that the cancer was continuing to grow and that I would need actual brain surgery. So maybe that's the moment that cancer started to become more real when things don't follow their initial plan and when I really am taking those first steps into the dark. However, the craniotomy went fine. I was actually out of hospital really quickly and left pretty much unscathed in terms of side effects. And so when I came out, I had this sense of invincibility. When you're younger, it's a lot easier to feel invincible until these things keep happening to you. After I had that craniotomy, it wasn't too long until I had a spinal metastasis. And then I had another brain one. And then I had another spine one. And then another brain one. And then a small intestinal one. And then a pancreatic one. My seventh relapse occurred at the beginning of this year. So I stand in front of all of you now as a cancer patient with a brain tumor, and I don't feel invincible anymore. Time ages you, and it makes you see things in maybe not so naive of a light anymore, but the harder lesson to learn was how pain ages you, and it makes you realize how fragile you really are. It was in July of 2021 that these realizations of fragility finally came to full light for me. It was on July 3rd of that year that I was rushed to the emergency room for a debilitating pain I was experiencing in my abdomen. It was pain so bad I actually thought an organ was rupturing. So because of this, once I got to the ER, I was loaded up on pain medications, meaning that I was really only half lucid when the doctor came in to tell me New tumors had been found in my small intestine, in my pancreas, and that my operation date was tomorrow. Between all this, I really had no time to process what was actually happening to me until I found myself in a hospital room shared with three other patients. And it's frightening to find yourself somewhere where there are no familiar faces, where there are unfamiliar sounds, there's the sounds of crying and coughing day and night, and you don't get a say in whether it stops. The scariest part is knowing that you can't escape and that it's your own body that's trapping you there. Every day I could look at myself and I could see the thick stapled incision that ran all the way down my abdomen. And every time I looked at it, it reminded me of all the ways that my body was so broken that I needed to be cut open again and again just to keep on living. This incision immobilized me with a pain that constrained every single one of my movements, a pain that only became worse as this incision became infected. It was the slight contortions on the doctor's face as he peeled back the gauze underneath my staples that told me something was wrong before I even needed to look. And when I did look, I was greeted with the sight and the smell of a red-yellow pus leaking out from between my sutures. When you see something like that and you see the horror of your own body, there really are no comprehensive thoughts that you have. All I knew is that the hell I was in was going to worsen, and it did. This incision ate away at my flesh, opening gaping holes in that tissue around my incision. This tissue became so infected that eventually I could actually look down and see the pink of my muscles underneath, my insides quite literally exposed. And not only did this infection eat away at the tissue of my abdomen, it ate away at my strength. I was left with so little strength that my family would offer me entertainment, they'd offer me movies, books, conversations, and I refused all of it because I wanted no more connection to a world that I so desperately wanted to check out from. 
So more often than not, all the strength I had was just to stare at the wall, to stare at the ceiling. And in that room, there was nothing above me but a stained gray ceiling. Yet I would look at it as if it were the open sky, and I would pray and I would ask that it would all be over. At that point, I just wanted an end, and I didn't care if the end was dying. I just needed it to stop. And I think being broken down enough to wish that end upon yourself, that moment was when cancer became real for me and as real as it ever has been. From my diagnosis at 14 to now, eight years have passed and I have not been in remission for a single one of them. I've had 11 surgeries over those eight years, averaging to over a surgery per year. And when I think about it, there really is something that's inherently straightforward about surgery as a treatment. You know with a great sense of immediacy whether or not it worked. You're in, you recover, and then you're out. But what gets lost in this picture is the grief that accumulates inside of you as time passes and chips away. Every time my fingers trace over the scar that is permanently embedded in my abdomen, I feel a sense of emptiness. I feel a sense of emptiness knowing that something is permanently gone from me, knowing that even if I was asleep for it, that hands and tubes and scalpels have all probed and ravaged my insides. There's so much that I could say about this horror and this grief and this loss, but all I'll say for now is that I am tired. I am tired of losing another piece of myself with every year of my life that passes. And I'm tired that fearing that after enough surgery, there won't be enough pieces that I can give away anymore, that I will reach the end of the line. And then what happens? That question and all the uncertainty illness brings with it have completely altered the axis in which I can configure my life around. Every day is a waiting game for me. It's a waiting game between scans, between symptoms, between oncology visits, and it's agonizing. Sometimes I wish that my oncologist would just give me the bad news and assign me a treatment because at least that way I have an axis again. Because when you're in a waiting game, every decision about the future becomes precarious. I'd like to start my master's out of province next year, but will I be able to? I wonder about the future of my employment, if I'll be able to have a steady job. Even things that seem more frivolous, like travel, is still something that has a precarious to it. My friends and I bought tickets to see an artist in Los Angeles next year in February. And while I wish this could be a moment of nothing but excitement, there's still that fear that lingers over me. What if I'm on treatment and I can't go? What if I have a symptom flare while I'm there? And really, this is the highlight of the purgatory that I'm in now. I received radiation in April of this year for the tumor in my brain, and we've yet to know whether or not it worked. All we do know is that it's caused intense inflammation of the brain again, inflammation that's resulted in me having seizures and still being prone to neurological symptoms. Prior to the radiation, I was consulted by neurosurgeons who told me that if this tumor were to be operated on, I was looking at guaranteed permanent loss of function in my left leg. So, while I wait to find out whether the radiation worked or not, that sense of precariousness is still there. If it didn't work, really my only option is CAR-T. And so this is really the reason that CAR-T is so important. It's a treatment that actually takes a patient's body into account rather than taking away from it. And maybe with this, you would have thought that my initial involvement would have had a bit more of a story to it. But really, all it was was someone approaching me from the biobank, asking me if I'd 
like to donate my samples. And I said, sure, why not? It's not like I was going to do something with them. So I signed consent forms, and then it was a forgotten thought for years until the fall of 2021, actually, when a research team out of the University of Calgary told me that something was actually happening with these samples, that a project had started, and that it had the potential to be a very powerful immunotherapy. And with that, I was, I was amazed. I actually didn't think anything would happen at all with these samples. And that amazement only continued to grow as this project has grown, as CAR-T has grown. And I could not say in honesty that I'm grateful for cancer because I'm not. But I can say that I do have a deep sense of happiness knowing that everything I've had to go through has been able to contribute to something that is so promising and so wonderful. So this story of mine that I've shared with you has had no shortage of pain of suffering, of endurance, but I can say with my full heart that I love this life. I love the things I get to experience, I love the things I do every day, and I love the people that I have in it. Many of them are here, and I'm not ready to let you go. I'm not ready to let all those people go, to let those experiences go. And I am fearful of a future where I might start a treatment with unknown outcomes, but I'm still grateful to be given a future that doesn't entail the permanent loss of pieces of myself, of functions that I have. Really what this all means to me is a continuation of something that I have held on for for so long and I continue to hold on to. Even if the path I walk down and the treatment I start brings more pain, more suffering, and more difficulty with it, those are pieces of life that I will gladly take if it means that I still get to be here. Thank you. Thank you to all three of you, especially to you, Milan. Um, I had a whole bunch of questions, and I, I'm not going to ask them. Uh, that was really powerful, obviously. And I think it can't be very easy to stand up and deliver that message um, with people who are here wanting to learn about cancer treatments, but also your family. And so I, I wondered why you have been making this choice for many years to keep speaking out about what you're going through, even when things are uncertain and the story is hard to tell. That is a fantastic question. Um, I guess to answer in maybe more of a long form, a lot of my initial speaking was fundraiser focus. So I think it was really easy to see how my contribution and my story could directly raise funds and help organizations. But I think as I've progressed through that and gotten to an event like this, where you know this isn't necessarily fundraising, it is just telling a story, I wanted to really give an, a raw and honest look at what this whole experience looks like. Because I find in the dialogue of cancer, and even in a lot of those fundraising speech, speeches, you get a very sanitized version of what the cancer experience is. And that's not to invalidate any of the other people who speak on this, but I just find that so much of that pain doesn't get to be expressed. And of course, it's so difficult to stand there and express that, but it's been an important thing for me to do, which is why I continue to do this and why I get a lot of fulfillment out of doing it. I'm glad to hear you get fulfillment out of doing it. I, I didn't know how hard that was for you tonight. Um, it, it was actually hard for those of us in the front row to think we were going to get up here and sit on, sit on a stage and keep it together. <laughs> um, but 
I think we have been, we have listened to 12 speakers now over the course of this, these talks, and they have all meant something. But you are why this work really matters. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, how, I mean, how do you feel now? You talked about the uncertainty and not knowing what's next. Are you, do you have excitement about CAR-T therapy? Like, what does that feel like? It's a mixed bag. I mean, yeah, it's, I guess you could look at it as, would you rather do this treatment or would you rather you know, lose your own life. So the, the fact that I do get something that kind of can propel me forward and to not, you know, to keep me alive, I guess, so to speak, is obviously so exciting and amazing. And I think even thinking that I had something to contribute to that, again, is so, so exciting. But then, of course, there's that part of me that deeply fears going into that and even thinking about you know being back in the hospital, doing the whole treatment thing again, being there for weeks, yeah, it sucks to think about, but yeah, I'd still take that over that permanent loss or over death. So that's that's the big thing, I guess. That's important about it. And, and I want to. I think this came through, but I want to make sure that everyone understands. You also did your Bachelor of Health Sciences. Right, like you, you finished high school and then your bachelor's yes. during all of this. So, yes. and now you work as a researcher. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I actually, honestly, I don't know how I did that. I don't know. Maybe it was just. I even think sometimes the timing of things is so lucky. Not not lucky because obviously a lot of the stuff is very unfortunate. But a lot of my surgeries either happened during summers that I had off, or I was just out of them fast enough that I could keep things up and to be honest I think for me academics were they were a crutch they were a crutch that I could again have that axis of my life configured around and I held on to that so tightly which I think is why I finished everything on time just kept running through it um, so one theme that I noticed listening to all of you um, is is the importance of like multidisciplinary collaboration like physician, researcher, like scientist who, who bioinformatician. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and then and, and patient advocate and researcher. And can you speak to how important it is to work with people outside of your discipline as we further some of these, these uh, treatments in cancer? I, th I think it's because not one person can do it all. Um, you know, I'm, I have the honor of being on the front line, being the direct contact to the patient um, who comes in with the problem. And, you know, when we don't have that ready-made solution, an off-the-shelf type of therapy, then we have to look outside of that. Um, and so having a person or group of people where you can present the problem to and say, look, this is what we have. Can we come up with a solution for this? And that's where we, we get the scientists involved. Go back, go back to the cells, go back to the cancer right at the beginning and say, How, what can we do to fix this? And, and that's really what we did here. That's exactly what we did. Because at the end of the day, who, who wouldn't want to treat this young lady, <laughs> right? But she, she's got a lot going for her, and, 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 and that is our motivation to do what we do. Absolutely. I think there's, um, there's so much inspiration to be found in what's happening like uh, in individual patients, and, uh, and I, we contact them through doctors. It's a mediated relationship in a sense. Uh, but it's also, um, like you're saying, everyone is involved in research in cancer research. It's, it's a very large field, it's international, it's global, right? There's millions of people working on cancer research, right? Um, and it's necessary. We get our inspiration from, you know, findings that, are, that were made in a completely different environment, right? And we go back to our, our, all of our data repositories that we have, right? And we try to see, can we see the same thing, you know? Or, uh, you know, do we find something that's a little bit different, actually? Um, and uh, that's how we can refine our idea of what these treatments can be. Milan, I mean, you work, 
you have this interesting relationship with researchers here in Calgary. I do. It's interesting and a privilege for sure. I think it's wonderful that I have the personal investment in it, but I also love the fact that I'm a scientist too and I get to be excited about these developments and I get to see the cool mouse pictures that Mona shows that apparently you can't always show on screen. And I get to be excited about that. I love that figure. So <laughs> it has been really exciting. I think I can even see in my own smaller microcosms and dynamics here the importance of you know speaking to patients, speaking to scientists, and having that bridge between everything. I love being able to just even have that bridge in my own life. Well, let, let's talk about uh, CAR-T therapies now as a, a reality for people in Canada. Who, who and where are people eligible for CAR-T therapies? So um, CAR-T therapies is actually a very specialized treatment. Um, and if you think back to the CAR-T history in Canada, it's really um, only really been around probably for five years. Uh, and initially only in two sites in Canada, um, in Montreal and in Hamilton, where they were participating in clinical trials. So that's usually what happens with new therapies is they're introduced first as clinical trials. Um, and that started probably about 2017. And in 2019 is when Health Canada approved, first approved CAR-T uh, therapy for patients in Canada. And because those two centers had participated in clinical trials, they were also the first two centers to off, be able to offer these treatments. And then it um, spread across the country after that. I think a second center in Ontario opened up, and Alberta, the one in Calgary, was the first center west of Ontario and had been for some time. And we opened for standard of care in, in 2021. We had, would have opened the year before, but COVID changed things, so things got delayed. Um, uh, and so we've been able to offer it to any patient who qualifies, and it is, it, predominantly blood cancers right now, um, because that's where uh, most of the research has been done. Uh, and um, very few sites in Canada are doing clinical trials for CAR-T outside of that. And so this is an evolving field, one that we're very excited to be participating in. Um, though there's still actually some provinces that don't have CAR-T that want them. So our, our neighbors here on, on the West BC, they still don't have a CAR-T program up and running and have to ship their patients to other centers in Canada um, because of the resources, the, the, the need um, for patients to be hospitalized. Um, this, it's a very special therapy, and, and I think it's an important one that's going to expand very rapidly, um, very quickly over the next few years. So uh, um, I have the privilege of, of working with the province, um, Alberta Health, and trying to predict what's going to happen. And um, we've asked for a lot more money. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you in January whether we got it or not, but we really, we really expect it to take off um, and start to see it used earlier in the disease course so that instead of waiting till patients are you know, end of line for cancer treatment, we're getting it maybe even second line treatment for some of these very aggressive tumors. Um, uh, I, which I think will result in better outcomes and, and less, less unnecessary toxic chemotherapy treatments that we're giving now. Um, do you s foresee a time where it is given as a first-line treatment? Uh, you know, they've, there's a couple studies out there that are looking at that right now, trying to pick out the really high-risk patients. Um, and, um, you know, we're, we are seeing good activity uh, uh, and responses. I think that that is a research question that needs to be answered. Uh, I think more people want to see it for other cancers as well. So it, it could really, really take off, and I, I won't be out of a job anytime soon. <laughs> Yeah, there are definitely studies that are looking at in solid cancers where there's lots of demand, uh, and they're showing some success there. Uh, not, in, not available in Canada yet. But, yeah. And then if we, we look at maybe precision medicine more broadly, are there other therapies that are like new immunotherapies that are sort of similar to CAR-T therapy, both in the way they work and the, the potential for them? 
And if there are, right. what are they? Yeah, for sure. Um, so CAR T is a CAR T is a kind of cellular therapy. Uh, so that's the novelty of it. And there's there are obviously uh, not obviously there are there are other um, cellular therapies that are being developed and, and conceived, um, although much earlier in their in their stages. I think there are other targeted therapies that have been around for the last decade or so, um, and these are in use and available. Um, but yeah, this, the cellular part of the CAR-T th therapy is what's new. Yeah. Yeah. Your slide with all the, the different pills, how different will that look in five years? Yeah, well, I think, I think cellular therapy is a, it's a precision medicine, right? And they, it's designed to target one specific protein on a patient's tumor cells. And so you can, it's, we've talked about it today as like a, um, a personalized therapy, but um, I believe Dr. Shafe even referred to it as the fact that it will be, it will be useful for any patient tumor where that, um, where that protein is present, that target. Um, so I think those are, we can consider those targeted therapies and there's many, many being developed around the world that if they're tested and safe and effective, we'll start to see a lot more of those for sure. So uh, we're running a bit behind, I think, so I, I'm going to open it up to audience questions a bit early. Um, and so we do have people with microphones, I think. Yeah, wonderful. And they'll be running up and down the aisle. Uh, it is hard for me to see from here. So if you have a question, just put your hand in the air and like wave it really furiously. I see some down here. And then I have one, well, I have two favors to ask of you from up here. Um, Let's try and keep, make them questions and, and uh, more concise than what I'm stammering out right now. And uh, if you could please not ask um, any of our panelists for personal medical advice. That puts them in a pretty tough spot. The lady in the white jacket. Oh, yeah. I have an honor to ask the question first. Um, thank you very much for the presentation and for all the incredible information that you shared and with the hope that you provide to the people over here and knowledge about what people actually experience. That means a lot for me, at least here. Um, so my question is, given that I also have a biology background and I'm geneticist, actually. So... Um, before, it was impossible to have human genome sequenced in a commercial verse, right? So people did not have an access to, uh, let's say, oh, I want to know what diseases I have and potentially um, treat them before they even started, right? So they will not progress to some hard and stages. But right now it's possible and it's actually possible like in US and even in Canada to do it commercially. So if you can speculate how much it will contribute to um, let's say patients life if they will be able to sequence their genome before like having a symptoms and be admitted to the hospitals. Thank you. Take that one. Sure. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I mean, genetic testing has been uh, been growing in recent years, and I think people want to have more control over their own health, um, and especially preventatively. I can understand that. Um, I think it's a challenge because uh, DNA sequencing data is not. It doesn't give you a yes or no, right? It gives you many millions of variants, which you can start to look at in the context of a population. Right. Uh, even the way we do that research, there's a, always a bit of uncertainty, right? Because you need to you need large numbers of people and large numbers of uh, patients to be able to uh, make firm conclusions. So I I think um, making it accessible, you know, there's an initial excitement about that, but I think it will be challenging for that to be interpreted easily. Although I would like for it to be more more easily accessible. But I think ultimately that would be the goal, right? To mm -hmm. be able to prevent cancer from developing in the first place. Um, and, and that is our holy grail, really. Next question. Behind there. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Um, first, amazing resilience and strength uh, by you and 
Um, I personally, as a care partner and caregiver to my wife, who is a cancer RN at uh, BC Cancer Agency 30 years ago, and then Tom Baker, she passed last year from metastatic renal cell carcinoma, translocation XP11.2. Dr. Danny Hang, Daniel Hang, looked after her. But um, I guess my question is to the gentleman when I came in, talk about a lot of FDA drugs. We went through, when my wife was diagnosed after breast cancer at 41, when we had three little baby boys who asked if mom would be okay, and we said she looks good now. She won't look as good when she goes through the chemo <laughs> to maybe look better. And then when she had kidney cancer and Dr. Marty Duffy took her kidney and adrenal gland, so the surgeries, the chemo. Um, I guess my question is, we ended up going through all the lines of therapy at, available, and then we went into where we paid out of pocket for genome mapping and for a drug therapy on an unproven line six, which is fine to hopefully make a difference. It be Nevo, Cabo, Pembro, you know, everything I didn't need to know as a banker. Um, where does this all go as far as FDA versus Canadian approvals, and yet we're provincially regulated, so some drugs for my wife were available in other provinces covered and not here, and I know it's a generic question, but it really, really affected the mental strength of us even considering moving provinces. And I listened to resilience and strength, and some things are developed here. How do we take care of patients on a national level when something's developed in one part at the Jurovinsky Center, say in Hamilton, where I just was helping out with the Cancer Research Society, or, you know, I'm just generally to help amazing people live, so. That's my question. Yeah, I mean, you might be better to answer this question. So um, there are actually two distinct ways medicines um, are approved. So there's the approval from Health Canada, which says, which says you're allowed to receive the treatment. And then the second approval is funding, um, which is a provincial matter. And uh, cancer care, as you know, is not cheap. And so what happens when a new therapy comes along, there's actually a national body that um, reviews each medication for whatever indication, and they receive input from all kinds of groups, patient groups, phys physician groups, and then uh, goes through a process to look at the cost effectiveness of the treatment and, and really what the benefit is and how much it's actually gonna add to the system. So even some very expensive therapies, like CAR T-cell therapy, are being approved um, because of the uh, reported benefits. The, the, the higher the likelihood that cure is on the table, the more likely that the treatment will be, be approved. And so sometimes it's really difficult, especially for rare cancers, or less common cancers. We know that a treatment for her tumor is never going to come through commercial means. Um, and so that's what was one of the reasons why we wanted to develop our own medicines. And, and the idea isn't so that we can come up with a medicine that we can market and sell. Obviously, we actually want to offer it to, to real patients who, who need those kinds of medicines. Um, I think it's very difficult sometimes to be a, a cancer patient who doesn't have the options or doesn't have some of the financial means to try some of these therapies that may be available in the U.S. but are not available um, in Canada. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's very hard. And I, I do, as someone who writes about these new therapies all the time, I wonder how much cost will be an issue in access. It, it, I mean, it, because we, we want to be... It, our, can't, our, our healthcare system is a universal one, right? So we have to factor that in when we're providing care to patients. And so it, it, advocacy here is really important um, and trying to get the, the right people to listen to um, the needs of patients 
Um, and the more national um, it is, actually the more effective it is, trying to get every province to do the exact same thing. Thank and you. I would, I would add to that that, like, you know, as we were speaking before, just about how international research is, right? Some, some location will champion something, uh, and that's really a good place to start testing it and seeing how good it is. Right? And if it's really that good, it will start to be adopted. Right? And, and some medicines might be expensive at first, but over time, uh, you know, other versions of it will be made that can be more accessible perhaps, and, and things sort of do spread over time. But it's not immediate that everyone's on the same page, for sure. And, and there are actually um, um, initiatives right now to try to come up with CAR-T that mimics what's already available commercially at a fraction of the cost. So I, I have colleagues in Edmonton who are already doing this, who are using CAR-T with the same target against uh, um, blood cancers that's available commercially, but at a, at a fraction of the cost. Uh, and, and that really is very attractive to Canadians, being able to do it cheaper, <laughs> right? So, so that we can do more and, and, and offer it to more patients. Uh, next question. And I see a couple of hands down here. Three. I was just wondering from your point of view how the new cancer center is going to um, progress research and um, help to have better patient outcomes. Thank you. We have big plans for that cancer center. Um, uh, I, had, I had mentioned at the tail end of my um, talk uh, a, a new program that we're developing. Um, uh, like those weren't just words. Um, we are going to build a new research center within the cancer center that's dedicated to this type of research. Um, and we're really, we're really just in the um, uh, kind of strategic planning stage right now to to um, to design a program that's going to use the talent that we have already here in Calgary to move research forward. So you'll hear a little bit more about that over the next few months, I hope. <clears throat> How could you define a uh, neutral cancer cell from a like dangerous cancer cell? A neutral cancer cell versus a dangerous one? I would say a cancer cell is a dangerous one. But before cells become cancerous, they're just cells. So they're not dangerous, right? And they can, you know, when the DNA of the cell changes, then they slowly become dangerous when they start growing out of control. <laughs> there were some questions down here. I was just wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about stem cell transplants and bone marrow transplants for hematological cancers and the kind of evolution and success rates. Sure. So, um, so, so CAR T cell therapy is cellular therapy where we, uses, we use the patient's own immune system to attack the cancer. Um, stem cell transplants are a little bit different, and there are two different types. Um, when we talk about stem cell transplant where we use a patient's own stem cells, the way we treat the cancer is actually just plain old chemotherapy, just really high doses. And the stem cells that are used in that situation really don't do anything other than help rescue the patient and, and recover from the treatment. It's the chemotherapy that treats the cancer. Whereas when you talk about a donor type of stem cell transplant, that is a form of immunotherapy. Um, but in this instance, we are using a new immune system, a different immune system, one from a stranger or um, um, a family member that has a match. And that new immune system goes out and attacks the cancer. But the problem with that is that not only does it attack the cancer, it can also attack the patient um, because you're not getting those cells from an identical twin. You're getting it from somebody who is different from you. 
and sometimes you can get an overactive immune system and you get what's called graft versus host disease, which can actually cause a lot of problems. So it's not perfect. Um, I think that um, stem cell transplants have a very important place for some diseases, some aggressive leukemias in particular. But ideally, if you could use something else, um, uh, the CAR T cell therapy where it targets the cancer using the immune system, it is actually much less toxic to do that, and you don't have this worry of graft-versus-host disease. So there are actually um, looking at CAR T cell therapy as an alternative to doing a donor type of stem cell transplant. Um, and CAR T cell therapy for um, lymphoma is now replacing uh, uh, your own stem cell transplants for patients with lymphoma. It's actually better. It was proven to do that. Um, and so that's where we're, we're moving. You know, talking about moving the treatment earlier in their disease course. So we're, we're, the idea, again, at the end of the day is offering better treatments that are less toxic to patients. And I, I think that's going to change how we look at many different types of cancers. There were a couple hands down here. There's one on this side. And was there one? And both on, in the same row. Either end of the fourth row. Hi. Uh, Health Canada's processes are largely set up to deal with pharma pharmacy generated, pharmaceutical company generated reagents. And before Health Canada is going to prove what they want, to see a good clinical trial run. And that's going to take anywhere from three to five years, maybe longer, to uh, get the candidates, get the uh, proof of uh, safety and the proof of uh, treatment. It seems, from what you showed us tonight, that the pace of science is moving faster than I can imagine Health Canada ever being able to keep up. So, <laughs> so for things like, like this, um, on two levels, uh, one, if someone has a, a disease, and there's something that looks like it's going to be efficacious. Can you get approval by signing waivers, whatever, to do that as a one-off trial? And secondly, what do we need to do in our whole healthcare system clinical trial process to keep up to the pace of science? Were you listening to us earlier? <laughs> Actually, I spent uh, six hours today with the Canadian Clinical Trials Group as a patient rep on the uh, yeah, Data Safety you know. Management Committee. So. I, I spent a lot of time today looking at the whole clinical pri uh, trial process. Yeah, no, I, I think there's, there's definitely room for improvement when it comes to speed um, and moving things forward. Um, you'd be surprised, the, one of the longest things that it takes is a contract uh, between um, our center and say a pharmaceutical company that wants to um, pitch a clinical trial. Uh, we're learning this because we're developing these therapies ourselves, um, and we had our own uh, contract issues with the university and Alberta Health and everything else. There's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes before a patient can get treatment. Um, but we can make exceptions and, um, and in fact, do these one-offs, these single patient studies. Uh, um, uh, that's a, something that we've never had much experience with, but um, we were very motivated to do something like that when it, things started to develop so fast. When we have a patient who you know, may not make it to a proper clinical trial, we gotta do it faster. So there, there are ways to kind of go around that, um, but certainly lots of room for improvement. We need more people, we need more researchers, we need more um, regulators, we need more nurses, we need a lot of things in order to, to get things moving much more quickly. So nice to have people like you as part of those committees to, to advocate for us. Uh, I'm just wondering, how do you possibly stay on top of the reams of cancer research that is happening around the world? <laughs> and does AI or will AI play more of a role in assisting you there? Well, as I said, we are not just one person. I think we're a huge team. Um, and um, my area of specialty is hematology, um, and I knew nothing about sarcoma 
uh, this past year, so I had to learn quite a bit. But I have really good colleagues who specialize in those areas, who give me advice, um, who know what to look for. And we have ex some excellent oncologists here, huge teams. And that's what we do. I, I can't learn everything. I, I, I can't. And so I have my little niche, and then my partner beside me has hers, and somebody else has theirs. But we do come together, usually uh, at big meetings or other things where we have an opportunity to, to review our science. Um, the action team um, um, brought us all together um, this past May, and everybody had a chance to speak as to what they're doing in their lab. So I could listen as a clinician to see what's happening and what's building, so that I know that the guy who's thinking about bringing a treatment for leukemia now has the opportunity to come to my team and present his research. So it, it really is about communication and, and learning about what your neighbor is doing um, and, and being out there, talking to people out here, attending conferences and presenting research. There's a lot of cool stuff that we're doing and the only way you're really gonna know is by paying attention. I would, yeah, I would totally agree. And I, I moved into cancer research about, uh, I would say five years ago and uh, it blew me away how much, how, how much of a collaborative world it is compared to some other research areas, um, even just locally. Locally, there's tons of collaborations, but also internationally at conferences and, and within the field. Um, so there's, it, there is lots of, and that communication is, is how you learn how you fit in, right, to what needs to be done and what's happening, right? And you need to have all of those things. Yeah. And we're all part of different networks. Um, so I'm part of the Canadian Clinical Trials Group, um, and then when they got wind of what we were doing here, they got really interested. Um, and we were already thinking about creating a bigger trial that would involve multiple sites across country. And then so what we did is we presented it. It's like, this is what we want to do, and a lot of people were interested. And we have three or four other sites that are now wanting to sign up and, and be involved in this project. Um, and so I... I, I do think it's important for, for us to spread the word and, and talk about this work to move it forward. I, I think we have time for one more question. Okay, uh, hello, <clears throat> over here. Is it louder? Where, where um, I'm wondering if, um, where is it? Where, where? I think somebody said it was easier to work with uh, blood cancers than with um, a solid tumor, I, I would think a solid tumor would be easier. It's right there in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> what, I'm, what I meant by that is, you know, um, cer certain, a, a B cell cancer, B cell lymphoma or leukemia, they're very similar on the outside. Um, and so they have same, the same target can be found in multiple different cancers. And that's really what we're looking for is that target. Whereas a solid tumor, they actually are different on the outside. Some of them have a specific protein and some of them don't. And what makes it even more difficult is, is sometimes the same tumor in different parts of the body are different on the outside. So a protein that you might find in the primary tumor may not be found on the site that's metastasized to the lung. And so when you give a treatment, you wanna make sure that it hits both sites of the tumor. Um, and so that was one of the more remarkable things about this um, discovery is that when we found this protein, it was found in every single one of her tumor cells. So it didn't have to be just the one that was in her leg or just the one that was in her lung. It was in every one of them. So, and, and, and solid tumors are, are a lot more complex because they do develop from normal tissues. So when you think about cancer treatment or treatment that's directed towards a protein, you want to make sure it's just on the cancer cell and not on a normal healthy cell. And that's one of the other reasons why um, treating a, a tumor, a solid tumor with a CAR T is more difficult because of these what we call on target, off tumor effects. In, in blood cancers, it's predictable. We know what the off tumor effect is in normal B cell. And if you get rid of normal B cells, you'll lose antibodies, which we can actually manage. We can, we can replace antibodies with um, a treatment called IVIG. 
But with solid tumors, it's a little bit different. If you have that on a normal cell, and then the CAR T comes along and can't distinguish between the cancer cell and the normal cell, you could actually have damage to that normal cell. Um, and that's what makes it just a little bit more complicated. <clears throat> um, how are we? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, before anything, before I thank anybody, I want to thank the three of you, Mona, Ted, Milan. Thank you so much. You've been wonderful tonight.